Uh, good morning. Thank you for joining uh, this quarterly Michigan Alliance for Greater Mobility Advancement MAGMA Advisory Council meeting. I'm Michelle Economo Uresti, the Executive Director at the Workforce Intelligence Network WIN and convener for the MAGMA Governing Board, which is comprised of automotive OEMs, manufacturing tier one suppliers, and industry stakeholder groups. MAGMA is leading the recently awarded State of Michigan Sector Strategies EV Jobs Academy, which is connected to the Global Epicenter of Mobility GEM Initiative, which is the topic of our discussion today. On behalf of the MAGMA Governing Board, I would like to thank and welcome our panel of speakers and moderator. Our esteemed moderator is Bernard Sawicki, the Vice President of Mobility and Research at the Detroit Regional Partnership and oversees industry and research work for the Global Epicenter of Mobility GEM as the Detroit region works to retain and expand its global mobility and automotive leadership through a world-class advanced mobility industry sector. In this role, Bernard leads automotive and mobility research efforts in support of GEM as it works to enable the Detroit region's existing mobility ecosystem bec to become better connected, smarter, more inclusive, and quickly and quickly adapt to change. Bernard previously served as the Senior Director of Research and Director of the Automotive Communities Partnership at the Center of Automotive Research CAR, where he managed analysis of vehicle sales, production, and segmentation data. He has also led trade missions to China, Italy, India, and Russia. We have an outstanding speaker lineup for you today. Uh, Bernard, please introduce our first speaker. Okay, uh, Michelle, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate the uh, opportunity to, to moderate the panel today, especially with such a fantastic speaker lineup. Uh, and of course, given my involvement in, in GEM as well. Uh, so with that, I'd like to bring up JB De La Fuente, who will be our first speaker. Um, and JB is the Director of Regional Initiatives and Grant Compliance at Semca Michigan Works. Uh, he oversees and manages the implementation of the talent transformation component of the $52 million Global Epicenter of Mobility Initiative for Southeast Michigan. Uh, JV began his career as a co-op student at a GM truck assembly plant in Flint, and upon graduating from Kettering University, he continued to work at the plant as an industrial engineer, focusing on efficiency and ergonomics issues on the chassis and engine lines. Um, earning his MBA from the Johnson Graduate School of Management at Cornell University in 91, he joined GM Saturn Corporation. In his nine years at Saturn, he held field operations roles supporting Saturn's retailers in the Philadelphia and Metro New York territories and central office roles supporting export markets, managing budgeting and business planning processes and executive level meetings and requests. Uh, he left Saturn in 2000 to become a founding partner in Clear Blue, which is a marketing communication startup in Splashworks and MMSDC Certified Event Support Agency. Uh, continuing to find outlets for his entrepreneurial spirit, he left those organizations in 2007 to work as a small business consultant, working with clients in logistics technology, restaurant franchising, and industrial flooring. Uh, and after the 2008 financial crisis, he joined Renaissance Sciences Corporation, a small defense contractor based in Phoenix, Arizona. As the business operations manager, he led the executive team through the implementation and ongoing usage of EOS, the entrepreneurial operating system to manage the organization. Uh, it's quite quite a list of accomplishments there, JV, and it's, it's great to be working with you on GEM and great to have you as part of this panel. So please take it away. And you are still muted. Apologies. Uh, thank you very much, Bernard. Mm -hmm. Let me uh, bring up my uh, the presentation. So um, thanks to Michelle uh, and the team who've asked us to present on on GEM and to provide and for me to provide a program overview of the GEM initiative. Uh, now, before I uh, get into the project details, uh, I do want to paint a picture of the uh, mobility landscape to give us some context into uh, the project itself. So 
I think everyone can agree that the world is experiencing its most significant uh, mobility revolution in the past uh, century. Uh, there are new technologies uh, that are disrupting the automotive industry while redefining you know, what mobility is and how people and goods move. Um, in 2021, uh, the global EV market was valued at $287 billion. And by 2028, it's expected to reach $1.3 trillion. Um, the shift uh, from internal combustion uh, engines or ICE to electric vehicles uh, presents historic challenges and opportunities uh, as new technologies are expected to require fewer parts and fewer people uh, to make them. Now, for those of you who don't buy into the fact that this revolution or evolution is happening, uh, this happens to be from today's uh, Oakland Press uh, front page. Um, obviously, the big news is the Taylor Swift uh, arrival in Detroit for the weekend. But, you know, at the bottom of the page, you know, two uh, prominent EV stories, you know, GM's uh, gaining access to uh, Tesla's charging network and Toyota building a $50, billion, $50 million uh, battery lab in Michigan. So if you don't think uh, this electric uh, evolution is happening, uh, it is, it, it's happening. Um, so currently, uh, the Detroit region is home to over 575,000 mobility associated jobs, and that translates to about $105 billion in gross regional project product. And so as the shift is happening, uh, no state in the country or, or region in the world really has more to gain or lose uh, than Michigan. Um, successfully navigating uh, this shift uh, is going to require a regional response, and not just one company or one initiative uh, that's going to be able to marshal like the 400 mobility assets that uh, make up the country's densest uh, automotive and mobility industry cluster. So. With that, uh, in late 2021 and early 2022, uh, the Detroit Regional Partnership led a group of local organizations to develop proposals for the Build Back Better uh, Regional Challenge. And this accumulation of proposals was focused on helping the Detroit region become known as the global epicenter of mobility. So what is GEM? Um, so as I mentioned, led by the, the DRP, uh, GEM was selected out of 529 appl applicants uh, to become one of 60 finalists uh, through phase one, and then eventually one was one of 21 uh, individual uh, grants that won uh, 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 funding and was one of the largest grants out of those uh, 21. Uh, the grant itself is $52.2 million uh, from the U.S. Uh, Economic Development Ag Administration, or the EDA. Um, the grant was awarded in September of 2022. Uh, its official start date is October 1st of 2022 and runs through May of 2027. So we have a little less than four years uh, to go on this grant. Uh, the GEM Coalition uh, is made up of five co-recipient organizations uh, managing six pillars and overseeing dozens of uh, separate projects. Um, our vision uh, for the initiative is to leverage the region's automotive, engineering, design, innovation, and manufacturing strengths, leadership, and assets as elements of a smart, secure, sustainable, and inclusive advanced mobility cluster. Um, the region itself, uh, the grant serves an 11 county region and is designed to accelerate economic growth by building on the region's mobility assets. Uh, I mentioned the 400 plus mobility assets previously. Uh, if you go to the Mish Auto website, they do a good job of uh, overlaying the different mobility assets uh, across the region, whether it's by manufacturing plants, suppliers, uh, things such as that. Um, GEM will create a smart, secure, sustainable, and inclusive 
advanced mobility industry, uh, starting uh, with the transition to next generation electric, autonomous, uh, and fully connected vehicles. And so while this initial uh, focus is heavy on electric vehicles, um, our GEM collaboration is taking a much broader view on what uh, mobility means and what companies and technologies may ultimately uh, be determined or, or may qualify for GEM uh, related services. Um, I mentioned there are five uh, partner organizations leading this project uh, and actually leading six different pillars. Um, SEMCA Michigan Works is leading the talent transformation project and Jacqueline uh, Salazar will be uh, speaking about uh, that particular pillar. Uh, Tech Town uh, leads Maine, which is the Mobility Acceleration and Innovation Network. Uh, the MEDC's Office of Future Mobility and Electrification leads the proving and testing uh, pillar. Uh, U of M's uh, Economic Growth Institute leads the Supply Chain Transformation Center, and Ashley will be speaking about that uh, later in the presentation. Uh, the Detroit Regional Partnership uh, leads uh, verified industrial properties uh, site readiness. And then supporting all of these organizations or all of these separate projects is the GEM Central project, uh, also led by DRP. Um, the main responsibilities uh, that uh, they're taking on include uh, the main convener of all of the different stakeholders uh, that are part of this initiative, um, pillar project management, so keeping us uh, in line in terms of our deliverables uh, and providing uh, technical support uh, across the pillars, uh, tracking our metrics, um, helping us uh, with mobility research and uh, data support, uh, actually led by uh, Bernard's team, uh, DEI, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion expertise, uh, supporting all of the uh, different component projects, as well as uh, centralized uh, GEM uh, communications. Uh, I mentioned that uh, the grant was $52 million uh, from the EDA. Um, one of the requirements for the award was for us to secure matching funds from uh, outside uh, non-federal organizations. And so the total award itself uh, with those $19 million in matching funds uh, is over $71 million. Um, the breakdown of the different uh, projects and, uh, and how much they received is detailed here with uh, DRP leading two projects, uh, SEMCA Michigan Works uh, leading the talent transformation, uh, U of M EGI, Tech Town, and Office of Future Mobility and Electrification. Um, as I mentioned before, GEM Central leads uh, uh, this uh, this group, this coalition. Um, their role is to help build the connective tissue to help the region's uh, mobility ecosystem, uh, accelerate cluster growth, uh, support transformation, uh, job creation, uh, deliver deliver more equitable outcomes, uh, and position the Detroit region as the global epicenter of mobility. Um, I went through some of the some of the functions that they perform uh, uh, and uh, support services. Uh, uh, they provide the needed capacity and expertise to ensure that the overall initiative is successful. Uh, I know they've been very helpful in terms of helping us each of the different pillars um, understand how to speak about Jim, you know, how, how are we dealing with our branding? How are we managing our communications? Uh, and, you know, this is just the start of, uh, of their efforts. Um, as far as the uh, GEM Central organization, um, uh, Christine Roeder uh, leads the GEM initiative. She's what's known as the RICO, uh, the Regional Economic uh, Competitiveness Officer. Um, that is a position that each of the 21 uh, coalitions that won a uh, an EDA award as part of 
build back better uh that's a, a position that is the head of that um that initiative uh she reports uh Christine reports to Maureen Donahue Krause, who's the president and CEO of DRP. Um, DR, uh, Gem Central currently has a number of open positions uh, that are in various uh, states of uh, uh, interviews and and such applications. So um, we have uh, openings for the DEI officer, uh, operations uh, and finance fiscal manager, and then uh, senior project manager for compliance and reporting. Uh, there is a new communications manager, Rebecca White. And uh, as Michelle mentioned earlier, um, Bernard Swicky is uh, on the right uh, as the uh, DRP uh, vice president of, uh, of research. Um, I want to touch on a few of the uh, other pillars uh, that um, that won't be here to speak today. Um, so TechTown uh, leads Maine, the Mobility Acceleration and Innovation Network. Uh, their purpose is to accelerate the growth of mobility startups uh, that drive innovation uh, to fill gaps in the mobility value chain. Um, the Mobility Acceleration and Innovation Network will develop a shared intake assessment and referral process for mobility-related entrepreneurs with deep support uh, for software and hardware development. Um, under the, uh, this pillar, there are um, seven support organizations, uh, Michigan Founders Fund, Invest Detroit, uh, Wayne State, uh, U of M's uh, Advanced Transportation and, ta and uh, Technology, uh, transfer uh, Centropolis Design Core Detroit and Endeavor Detroit. Um, MEDC's Office of Future Mobility and, Ele and Electrification leads the proving and testing pillar. Um, their purpose is to equitably increase the number of companies and small entrepreneurs and help them access the, the state's world class testing and proving assets. Um, so uh, their goal is to uh, help entrepreneurs access testing facilities, including subsystem and component level testing, uh, closed system testing and real world uh, demonstration projects. Um, you know, if you're not a GM or uh, Stellantis and you don't have your own proving grounds, there's no way to really uh, test your, uh, you know, autonomous driving or other technologies that you know you don't want on I-75 or Woodward Avenue. Um, this is here to help them, uh, you know, test those out uh, uh, as they as they progress. Uh, this pillar is led by uh, Catherine Snorrison. Uh, she's the interim uh, chief mobility officer for the state of Michigan, and uh, they have one support organization, Next Energy, and that is led by uh, Jim Saber. Um, Verified industrial properties, uh, site readiness. Uh, their purpose is to attract advanced uh, mobility business investments across the Detroit region. Um, their goal uh, through the verified industrial properties program uh, is to inventory, assess, and prepare development ready sites uh, to advance uh, a site's readiness for future development opportunities. And uh, it was interesting in a meeting yesterday, we heard that uh, they recently secured uh, over 350 acres of the old Buick City uh, uh, location in Flint. So uh, definitely, you know, some big properties that they are accessing and inventorying across the region. And that uh, that pillar is led by uh, Shannon Selby at DRP. Um, next, I just want to touch on a few of the uh, overarching program metrics. Um, our goal uh, out of this is to get a 3% higher than projected uh, number of quality mobility industry related sector jobs, 5% um, increase in mobility related industry wage growth, 5% uh, gain in mobility related uh, GDP growth, and a 25% increase in mobility related uh, venture capital investment in four years with 1,100 related jobs created from startups uh, in five years. Um, the uh, 
some of the outcomes that we're expecting out of this uh, initiative. Uh, $242 million in company investment, uh, $48 million uh, in wages retained, um, about 3,400 in new quality jobs, uh, 44,000 in retained jobs. And this uh, presentation will become available, will be made available, so I won't uh, read through all of these, but um, needless to say, um, we're expecting a, a significant impact uh, as the result of this uh, project. Um, so the EDA and the GEM initiative uh, both have a strong focus on DEI. Uh, in the initial proposal um, to the EDA, uh, DEI was actually a separate pillar, uh, but uh, it was decided after um, you know conversations and working through the proposal that really all pill all each of the pillars uh, had to have a responsibility for uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it is an ongoing conversation that we're continuing to have as a as a coalition. But you know some of the principles that are um, you know, helping us uh, move this forward uh, include uh, seats at tables to ensuring that diverse stakeholders have a position at all decision making bodies, mm. uh, outreach, um, prioritizing engagement from historically excluded communities, uh, leveraging inclusive design models, uh, staffing, uh, securing diverse consultants and staff as service providers. Uh, outcomes uh, requiring DEI metrics and outcomes as part of uh, all projects and communication, uh, ensuring success and learnings uh, that are shared with uh, DEI stakeholders. So um, that is uh, the overview of the uh, GEM initiative. Uh, as Michelle mentioned, uh, I'll be able to take questions afterwards, but I'll turn it back over to uh, Bernard to introduce Jacqueline Salazar. Hey, uh, JB, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for covering that content. It is a complex operation, uh, but I appreciate you making it uh, quite clear and understandable through, um, through your comments today. Uh, and one note uh, about questions. We've got a, a great turnout for the webinar today. Um, we ask that you submit your questions via the chat function, and we won't be taking questions with each speaker. We're going to do a panel afterward uh, after all of the speakers have finished speaking. So with that, I would like to introduce Jacqueline Salazar. Uh, Jacqueline joined Semca Michigan Works as the GEM Project Manager for Employer Services to help Southeast Michigan employers moving into the EV mobility space with their talent transformation needs. Uh, prior to this role, Jacqueline spent the last 20 plus years as a business owner of the talent acquisition firm Intelligent Solutions, which served Metro Detroit employers and gained recognition as a top supplier partner for Fortune 500 companies across the country. Um, she also has served uh, over a decade as Director Board Secretary for Intelligent Technologies LLC, a Tier 1 automotive foam fabricator, uh, she is the recipient of numerous awards, including the National Association of Women Business Owners, uh, Top 10 Women in Business Award, MANA, the Adelita Award for Community Service, Best of Michigan Business Staffing Category by, I'm sorry, Best of Michigan Business Staffing Category by Corp Magazine, and finalist for Supplier of the Year, Michigan Minority Supplier Development Corporation. Uh, also a Crane's top, uh, Detroit top Hispanic owned business uh, ranked several times over numerous years. Uh, Jacqueline did undergraduate coursework at Michigan State University and completed her Bachelor of Arts degree in public relations and communications from Wayne State University. She has also completed graduate coursework through Central Michigan University. Uh, that is quite a bio there, Jacqueline. Uh, congratulations on all those accomplishments and welcome to our panel this morning. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you, everybody. I'm glad to be here and um, share our initiative. And uh, JV did a great job, of course, giving the very broad overview. Um, it really is an expansive initiative. And um, 
I am representing uh, employer services for our GEM initiative. And so I will get started here. So the purpose of our pillar, uh, as I indicated, is talent transformation. And our um, key role will be to assist companies in equitably meeting advanced mobility talent needs, offsetting retirement and transition losses as people are retiring, and supporting career pathway advancement. And then system coordination to, uh, to support advancement in this mobility talent retention and development. Um, similar to having the co-recipients that JV discussed, we also have um, supporting organizations, um, sub-recipients to the grant. And um, those sub-recipients include Detroit Regional Chamber, uh, Detroit Future City, Ann Arbor Spark, Michigan Founders Fund, Upwardly Global, Global Detroit, and then five different Michigan Works uh, agencies throughout this 11 county region that we're covering. And I'll, I'll go in and describe what each one of those is contributing to our project. Um, within the SEMCA uh, universe and this talent transformation project, we have um, three, um, three entities or three service divisions and the first one is our business services, which I am leading for um, this initiative. And our purpose is to develop and operate a network of business facing advanced and customized talent consulting assessment and referral services. And our focus is to help businesses attract, retain, upskill and reskill their teams. I also have a counterpart um, who is on the call, Dan Reske, and uh, he is heading up talent services to coordinate and the development and operation of talent facing network to support talent needs at all levels throughout the Michigan Works agencies. And then the other key piece of, um, of our pillar is this network development and alignment, which you know really is key to what we're doing today, right? We, um, we are closely aligned with EVJA and um, the WIN team and are building those relationships and working together. Um, and we will do that with other partners as well. So as I indicated, we have multiple subrecipients. Um, first one in, in the, um, uh, on the screen here, of course, is Ann Arbor Spark. Um, and for the GEM initiative, their program aims to retain executive level talent within the ecosystem by embedding them with early stage mobility companies to help them achieve specific milestones. So they have, um, of course, we, you know, we're, I think we're probably all familiar with Ann Arbor Spark, but so they have been af af afforded GEM dollars to do this and to target um, historically excluded communities and businesses. Um, and of course, we all we <laughs> we're all aware of the Detroit Regional Chamber. So DRC um, will use GEM dollars to advance their Detroit Drives Degrees program to strengthen the talent pipeline. Um, that that program seeks to increase the proportion of individuals with college degrees and high skill credentials in our region. One of the other very cool um, subrecipients for um, or under SEMCA is Detroit Future City. And Detroit Future City is a think and do tank, and their focus really is on equity for Detroit residents. So they will concentrate on worker experience, convening tables, and equity member uh, measurements. Pardon me. Uh, one of our other partners is Global Detroit. And Global Detroit has metrics associated with the higher um, higher ed students and immigrant inclusion. So they work with immigrant student population to retain that talent pool in Michigan through internship programs with Michigan businesses. And we all know we are, um, you know, if, if, if you're out there doing business, you know that um, talent attraction and talent retention for the state is critical. So this is just um, one additional pool that we're working to keep here in Michigan. 
Um, Upwardly Global is another one of our sub-recipients and Upwardly Global, um, they're actually based out of New York, <clears throat> but they, <clears throat> pardon me, their metrics are associated with the immigrant refugee population and transitioning that population into our workforce. Um, another one of our sub-recipients is the Michigan Founders Fund, and they work with high growth entrepreneurs and those entrepreneurs commit um, not just their energy, but also their dollars um, for fellowship, culture, and funding solutions to uplift the communities across the state. And they have metrics associated with um, tech students and um, intern, uh, finding them internships. And um, they've already been operating in this space as well. And they're, um, they're doing great things already with interns this summer. Um, I also mentioned that we have um, five Michigan Works partners that um, cut across the 11 county region that we are supporting. And those Michigan Works agencies are Michigan Worth Works Southeast, uh, located down in Lenawee County, um, Michigan Works Macomb St. Clair, Oakland County Michigan Works, and GST, which is Genesee Shiawassee Thumb Michigan Works. And then there at the center, of course, you see Detroit Employment Solutions Corporation, <clears throat> which covers the entire uh, Detroit area outside or, or within the city itself. And they have a network of um, providers as well. So the region is well covered. Um, and, and JVE had this map as well, but just so you know, so you can you can see this and, um, you know, we could overlay the Michigan Works Agency so that you see that we have the entire territory covered. Um, okay, so we have both a talent network and business network that has um, metrics associated with our work. And somehow my talent network piece <laughs> got eaten up. Um, but this we'll we'll share this slide so you can dig in deeper and see. But um, both of our both sides of the entity have uh, metrics associated with our outreach and um, achievements. Oh, there we go. So um, as, as JV mentioned, um, this initiative across all of the pillars and all of the subrecipients has um, maybe new terminology, but a, a focus on historically excluded communities. And um, this is um, really a, a thought process that continues to evolve and is molded as we continue to um, convene through Detroit Regional Partnership. Um, but it, it's, um, you know, it's focusing on various communities and each of the pillars um, is working this um, initiative a little bit differently. In, in one of our uh, meetings yesterday, um, people are talking about historically community, historically excluded communities as geography. Um, we're looking at it as communities of people and um, touching on the Black, Indigenous, uh, Latino, Latina, and Latinx communities, women, LGBTQA plus communities, um, disabled and neurodiverse, returning citizens, veterans, refugees and immigrants, and then distressed and underserved urban areas and distressed and underserved rural areas. Um, and this really follows the Justice 40 guidelines um, set forth um, recently. I think it's through the Biden administration. And so, um, as I indicated, let me fix that. So we are um, very closely tied into what the EVJA Jobs Academy is doing. And the work that they've put together over the past um, couple of years is just, you know, um, pretty incredible. I'm I'm um, coming into this new and seeing the collaboration between um, our business community, our academic community, our training providers, and the nonprofits, and what they put together for um, 
for the training piece is, is pretty amazing. And so our GEM funds will be closely tied to the EVJA um, Academy, and we will work with EVJA and the Michigan Works Associations for both job seekers and incumbent workers and um, with, with a goal and outcomes to um, get people trained and raise their median income ra uh, range and get them credentialed. There we go. So I will turn it back over to you, Bernard. That's our piece there for you. Thank you so, so much. Jacqueline, thank you so much. Uh, great job. And uh, right, we have one speaker to go here in our lineup today, and that's Ashley Breitner. Uh, and Ashley, I'll uh, get to your bio here right now, but Ashley is the Managing Director of the Economic Growth Institute and newly appointed Workforce Director for the Electric Vehicle Center at the University of Michigan. Ashley works to ensure the university continues to be a trusted partner for communities and communities to address their ever-changing needs. Ashley teaches undergraduate and graduate level innovation courses at the University of Michigan College of Engineering Center for Entrepreneurship and is an Alovance, Alavance, I'm messing that word up, I am sure, uh, Alavance Certified Decision Coach. Uh, prior to working at EGI, Ashley managed global business operations for a variety of product and system certification programs in the public health and safety sector. She worked with thousands of customers across the globe to diversify their businesses. Ashley holds a BS in education from Eastern Michigan University and an MBA from Wayne State University. With that, Ashley, we will turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Bernard, for that introduction. Hopefully everyone can see my screen now. Okay. Yes, we can. Um, wonderful, thank you. So I appreciate everyone joining us this morning. I'm excited to be here to tell you a little bit of more about the Advanced Mobility Supply Chain Transformation Center. Uh, but like everything, we give it an acronym and today are calling it STC. <laughs> So JV mentioned um, a little bit about STC, and I'm going to go into it in more detail today. But before I get there, I wanted to give you a little bit of background about the Economic Growth Institute. I think many of you know us um, as we have ha held a seat on the MAGMA Advisory Board here for quite a few years now, but some of you may not know us. Um, and we're definitely a unique unit at the University of Michigan. So EGI, as we call ourselves, is an outward-facing unit that's been at the university for almost 40 years now. Um, and at the core of the work that we do every day, we are working towards equitable economic growth. And how we go about that is we leverage the resources of the university, their research, technology, expertise, to really foster innovation and create positive economic impacts for local, state, and national economies. Uh, particularly with a focus of working with small to medium sized enterprises and the communities where they reside. So EGI has been managing programs to support uh, research and provide business and community assistance, support and, and intervention for nearly 40 years. Um, throughout those years, we have trended busier when there's some type of economic disruption or transformation happening. Uh, which is why we are a key partner in the GEM initiative. And I'll, I'll explain more about that here in a second. So EGI, we do our best work um, when we're providing assistance around economic stabilization and equitable economic growth. This uh, graphic here just shows you that kind of where EGI's work intersects. So we draw on the resources of the university to conduct applied research and gain economic development, business intelligence, and resources that are shared with our clients in both companies and communities. So this work supports both companies and communities because we all know at the end of the day, uh, we cannot have a strong growing economy without having both strong communities and strong companies within them. 
So uh, well, yes, we are based in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Our staff and students working alongside our staff are working in communities and supply chains throughout the state of Michigan and beyond. Um, we do have programs that reach into other states, Indiana, Ohio, Virginia. Um, our reach is, is quite broad at the moment. Um, but this graphic here just shows it probably in about the last seven years where many of our projects have been across the state uh, to help companies and communities, again, with some type of economic disruption or transition, uh, the automotive crisis, the defense, defense sequestration, pandemic challenges, you name it. Um, and we've been working across the state to support companies and communities. So uh, because our team comes from backgrounds where they have lived and breathed the challenges of small to medium that small to medium sized manufacturers face. Uh, they are they're not traditionally academics. Most of them come from industry. They come from um, from economic development backgrounds. Our team, particularly working in STC, works really hard to become trusted advisors of the small to medium sized manufacturers that we're working alongside and digging deep with them to really create relationships where we can be a lifelong resource. So with the deep history of EGI's experience working in small to medium sized manufacturers, their supply chains, today EGI is leading the Supply Chain Transformation Center as one of the gem pillars that JV mentioned. So the goal of STC at the end of the day is to stabilize and strengthen the region's current mobility supply chain and to retain and develop needed manufacturing capabilities to ensure the greater Detroit region is truly the global epicenter of mobility. So while often we're looking at bringing in new companies, advancing technologies in businesses uh, in order to, to help them grow and be prosper, at the where we are focused specifically in the STC pillar is on those legacy manufacturers, companies that have supported the internal combustion engine or mobility supply chain for years and years and years, for decades, um, and they are an extremely critical part of our economy and uh, in in supporting our workforce throughout the region. And it's extremely critical that we try to help them to think into the future of mobility and prepare for what that looks like for their businesses. So why is EGI and STC a critical pillar of GEM? So we know that small to medium sized manufacturers today are struggling with everything from supply chain disruptions to workforce challenges. I know I'm preaching to the choir with this group um, in, in your day to day interactions with many of your suppliers. And often they, these manufacturers, because of their capacity and capabilities, really struggle to look beyond uh, getting product out the door and getting their people paid on a weekly basis, let alone looking five to 10 years out into the future. So the challenge in ca capacity that these companies have creates a significant risk for these businesses, their employees, and our economy. And so that's where STC comes in. So STC works to create uh, that capacity in these companies to help these valuable legacy businesses and manufacturers in our region really start to prepare for the future of mobility. So I'd wanna tell you a little bit more about our process. I'll still keep it fairly high level today, but I think it's important for you to have some understanding of how we work with companies. Um, as many of you may have companies in mind, um, in your supply chains or that you're working alongside every day that may need this assistance. <clears throat> so at the, you know, in the first step of the process, after we've determined the comp a company is eligible for assistance, and I'll talk here in a minute about what eligibility requirements we have, uh, we collect a basic application. We do sign an NDA with the, with the business because we're learning a lot of uh, confidential information about their business throughout this process that's really important that it's protected. And we also collect a set of financials uh, for the company that looks back a few years and, and uh, takes a look at their financials currently. And I'll explain why we do that here in a minute. 
Um, at, once we have those ba that basic set of information collected, usually it's pretty easy on part on the part of the company. We try to make this as simple as possible for them. Uh, then our project managers, again, those have lived and breathed uh, manufacturing in their careers um, and are now project managers at the Economic Growth Institute, go out and conduct a site visit. So during this site visit, our team really starts to dig deep to understand all of the opportunities and challenges the companies, those companies may be facing. Sometimes, you know, they're looking at all aspects of the business from planning to leadership to their people, marketing, legal, operations, and beyond. Um, in, in, you know, they really dig deep to try to get an understanding of where they're at and where there might be some opportunity uh, for diversification potentially into the electric vehicle market or other forms of future mobility. So we know that not all suppliers today supplying the internal combustion engine supply chain are going to be able to transition uh, to the electric to electric vehicle components because there's yeah, from my understanding, 30% less components. Um, so we have to help them, those where there is an opportunity, think into the future of electric vehicles and where there's not an opportunity potentially for them to leverage, for us to help them to leverage their assets in their business, their skills and capabilities to look and diversify into other markets. So once we go through and we do this assessment, this assessment leads to the development of a valuation and an opportunity plan for the company. So most small to medium sized manufacturers today do not know what their business is valued at or have an inaccurate description of what, what that value actually is in mind. So starting there uh, by analyzing their financials it gives us a baseline to level set with them and, and ultimately an opportunity plan that then lays out a set of recommendations to improve that value over a period of time. So giving us that baseline benchmark of their value will help us over the three-year period of this grant to determine how the projects I'm going to talk about that we help these companies to implement increases that value and the resiliency of that company. So this set of recommendations um, are ultimately scoped into what we call projects. Um, and the in between the organization and EGI's leadership teams, they sit down and they really decide what's in the best interest of that company to move forward with at this point in time. Often we see you know, a list of potentially 20 different opportunities in some of these companies, but we have to start somewhere. And so we look at those highest leverage points within these businesses to start to move the needle towards resiliency and the future of mobility. So this is where EGI uh, comes in as an extremely valuable asset. <clears throat> So let's say, for example, one of the pro opportunities is the company needs a marketing project to help them to market into the EV, EV sector. They know how to market in the internal combustion engine sector, but how do they market into to EV? Uh, that's just an example of a type of project we, we could move forward on this program. <clears throat> What EGI does is we dig deep into our networks and resources that we've worked with for, for years um, and some new ones, and we find those exact right resources for execution of the uh, to help the, assist these companies in execution of these projects. So these could be private sector consultants, they could be university resources, they could be federal lab resources. Just about anything that we can justify <clears throat> in order to support that company, we go through a pretty thorough vetting process to make sure we're finding resources that are truly going to meet the needs of small to medium sized businesses. Uh, there are many providers out there, but not all of them meet the needs of those small to medium sized companies. So we manage this whole process uh, for on behalf of the company, obviously with their input as needed. <clears throat> including the contracting process um, of getting that consultant onboarded and in and, and through the contracting process. So it's a lot less paperwork on behalf of the company um, and ultimately at the end of the day helps to create that capacity for them to move these activities forward. 
In addition to helping them find the right resources, the program also has the opportunity to co-fund these projects up to $100,000 per company. So it's a 50-50 cost share ratio between the company and the program. And this can be used for a variety of projects. It doesn't have to just be one really large project. It could be a series of small projects. Okay, so eligibility. <clears throat> this is the question we get often. Obviously, as JV teed us up, uh, the, the Global Office Center of Mobility is an 11 county region. Um, that you can see here on the map. So companies for assistance under the STC pillar have to be within those 11 counties. We are serving small to medium sized businesses, so less than 500 employees. At least 10% of their annual business revenue for has to be in the mobility sector either currently or sometime in the last five years. Mobi the definition of mobility is quite broad. It's not just internal combustion engine to electric vehicle. <clears throat> um, there's also an opportunity for companies that do not have 10% of their annual revenue in mobility, but that they demonstrate a critical potential to address a particular uh, need in advanced the advanced mobility supply chain can also be eligible. So as Jacqueline mentioned, um, we across GEM have a, a strong focus on making sure that we are serving historically excluded communities. So in addition to those few eligibility sets of criteria I just mentioned, um, we also will be giving priority to companies that meet the historically excluded communities definition. Um, this is both from a geographic perspective and a population perspective both ownership and population of the workforce within those businesses. So if they if we can determine that they meet one of these definitions of historically excluded, that the company would get priority over a, a business that does not meet this definition at this time. Okay, so that's the in general kind of the process that we take companies through in order to help them uh, think about the future of mobility. But in order to have equitable economic growth, it's extremely important that we work toward equitable outcomes for all companies in the greater Detroit region. And in order to do so, EGI, <clears throat> as part of the STC pillar, has formed an equitable outcomes advisory board. Um, this board is comprised of diverse individuals from across the region ultimately to guide STC and really hold us accountable to making sure that we are being very intentional about helping historically excluded companies in historically excluded communities. And we're reaching as deep as we can within our region to make sure that we are in front of all of them and assisting them as much as we possibly can. So the goal of this board is really to support and provide advice on equitable outcomes and effectiveness of the Supply Chain Transformation Center. So this does not reach, right now the board necessarily uh, does not reach across all GEM pillars. It is specific for STC. Um, but in the board, this board holds the values of full participation, mutual understanding, inclusive solutions, and shared responsibility. So EGI extremely, uh, we value their input. We've had a couple board meetings already as part in the first nine months of the grant here, and the, they are a tremendous resource to us and helping us really incorporate, um, incorporate their feedback and push out into those historically excluded communities, making sure at the end of the day, we're being fully inclusive of, of all of the, the companies in the region. So I know that was quite a lot um, from my end in terms of process. I'm happy to answer any questions when Bernard goes through and moderates through them. Um, my contact information is on the slide here also. Happy to answer any questions, but my call for you all today is obviously if you have companies that you're working with that you know are going to be impacted by this transition in mobility, please do not hesitate to send them our way. Kira Terry on our, our team um, is our, our front point, front line point of contact in helping these companies determine if they're eligible and getting them onboarded and assisted.
Okay. All right, Ashley, thank you very much. Um, just like our other two speakers, just a whole lot of content there to cover, and I'm sure uh, a whole lot of fodder for our discussion coming right now. Uh, and again, please feel free to keep those questions coming via the chat function. Uh, we've just got a fantastic turnout, so that is uh, a good thing because it kind of puts us into this chat mode where we can um, can kind of handle the questions there. Um, and maybe I'll just make a comment on one question and certainly invite uh, all the other speakers to, to do the same. Uh, but the question is, uh, the governor just announced that a large Norwegian hydrogen company is looking at locating a plant in Michigan. Uh, we hear a lot about batteries, but are we also looking at long term solutions like hydrogen? And can we speak to any efforts? Um, so I can I can take the first stab at this, um, which is that, yes, hydrogen uh, and other alternative energy sources absolutely do fall within the definition of the mobility work that GEM is undertaking. Um, hydrogen is an interesting uh, phenomenon because uh, if done right, you can have literally zero emissions mobility where a vehicle, you know, whether it's a bus or a truck or a personal vehicle, really emits only oxygen and water uh, when it's using the hydrogen type of generation of onboard electricity generation to drive electric motors. And the only question is, where did you get that hydrogen? Was, was it from a clean source? And if so, then you've got a bit of a utopian scenario of, of emissions free, you know, through the full supply chain and not just at the vehicle uh, mobility. Now, uh, access to hydrogen is a real issue. There aren't hydrogen stations uh, all around. Uh, and so right now it's thought of as a more likely candidate for fleets, whether they be government or commercial fleets, particularly trucks, uh, because those vehicles start and end the day at the same location. And so you can have one facility that, that fuels vehicles with hydrogen for an entire fleet uh, as opposed to needing that to be distributed throughout the area for uh, for the uh, general population to use. Uh, and so uh, from the, the GEM central point of view, absolutely, those technologies do fall within our realm of work. Um, and I know it's early days, but I'm curious uh, for any of our participants, uh, JV Jacqueline and, and Ashley, um, have you come across any hydrogen initiatives or companies in your work? Not specific. I'll 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 take a the first stab at that. Um, not specifically. Um, I know that uh, at an EVJA uh, meeting, probably in January or so, there was a presentation uh, from a company uh, discussing hydrogen, almost an introductory, um, you know, to hydrogen. Uh, it seemed to be you know more beneficial for uh, larger trucks. You know, as opposed to individual, you know, commercial or individual personal vehicles, but I'm not sure if it was a charging issue or if just the the capacity of of that uh, of that uh, particular energy. But um, I think I talked to this about any um, any technology really, in that it 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 really depends on what pillar you know they're angling at. So in the case of this hydrogen company looking to locate a plant. In Michigan, I, I know we're not talking specifically about that, but if a company were looking to locate, you know, they would be engaging, you know, DRPs, VIP. You know, if it's a startup, you know, that's looking to, you know, develop some sort of hydrogen solution, they might go through Tech Town. So, I'm not aware of any uh, hydrogen efforts or come across any companies, you know, dealing with hydrogen at this time. But that's not to say that there aren't across, you know, the other pillars. Yep, thanks, JV. And just as uh, uh, Randy uh, made a comment, for example, General Motors has a fuel cell uh, group and vehicles, uh, and most automakers, um, you know, most of the headlines are with the Japanese and Korean automakers, uh, but it, it is uh, kind of a global uh, phenomenon. And I have to tell you, throughout my career, uh, I've spoken with countless people who you know, were retiring uh, at the end of their career. And they said, you know, when I began a few decades ago, hydrogen was just around the corner. And now I'm retiring and it's just around the corner. So it's it's one of those technologies that's 
Uh, it's been in use, you know, in a number of applications going back for decades. Uh, it's just very challenging to to deploy it specifically in vehicles that go down the road. Um, OK, there was a question here that I really like, uh, and I want to sort of throw it at each of our of our participants and Jacqueline, maybe we'll start with you, um, you know, but it deals with metrics. Um, how will we measure the success of our organization? JV went through some of the big picture uh, indicators that we're going to be using in terms of job, wage, and GDP growth in the region. Um, but from the point of view of the specific pillars, Jacqueline, uh, I was wondering if you could take uh, take the, our lead there. Sure. So um, for each of um, our subrecipients and our being SEMCA as opposed to Gem Central, um, so I I can speak to that, but. Each of them will be reporting upward and, um, you know, they're submitting their metrics on a quarterly basis because we have to report into, um, <clears throat> pardon me, EDA, the Economic Development uh, Associate, <laughs> Association, EDA. Um, so um, we're tracking um, across our pillar um, we've allowed licenses into a, you know, it's a Salesforce based um, program called Launchpad. So everybody is reporting their metrics into that tool. And then we will, like I said, be reporting it upward. Um, and um, we we meet with all of our subrecipients on a monthly basis and we either convene the entire group or we convene them um, individually. And so they're reporting their progress to us on a regular basis. That's uh, part of our initiative and uh, metrics that we're tracking. Great, thank you. Thank you, and mm -hmm. um, Ashley, can you talk about what that looks like for your group? Sure, yeah. Yeah, over the next three years here, you know, we'll obviously be tracking metrics um, in particular, such as like number of companies served, number of companies assessed, a uh, number of companies with projects going through the process, but really at the end of the day, what we're working towards um, are those impacts. And the, the kind of the three critical impacts that we're looking at measuring uh, throughout the grant period, at least, and hopefully beyond is the percent in positive change in sales in the companies we're supporting, the percent in positive change in uh, average employment of those companies, and then also the percent in positive change in sales specifically related to advanced mobility. Um, so if we can keep them in advanced mobility based on their assets, that, that's our goal first. Um, and we'll be tracking that change over a period of time. We know those things, uh, you know, with projects, uh, implementation projects do not happen overnight, uh, new jobs and new sales. So over a period of time, we'll be looking for increases, hopefully uh, from the company served throughout the pillar. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Trina, I'd like to answer your question really quickly, whether this work will include regional transit planning uh, or is the focus mostly the technology and the workforce? Uh, and the answer is yes, it is. In fact, uh, the workforce and the technology and the companies that are working on those technologies. So transit planning itself is outside the scope. However, um, transit you know, companies and workforce and so on are absolutely within scope. Uh, so the engagement certainly will include uh, a whole host of transit providers, whether that be individuals or companies that are working on the technologies, uh, it just won't be um, in terms of planning and, and somehow implementing uh, changes to, to the system. Okay, great. Um, all right, so why don't we go back to JB? Um, you know, you talked a little bit about the general GEM operation and it's early days, but so far, uh, what are the biggest challenges that you're seeing in, in the operation? Um, so uh, I know Christine has, um, she talks with the other coalition uh, leads, the other RICOs of the 21 uh, uh, different projects and not just not unique to, to GEM, but across the board nationwide, it seems like staffing has been a top concern, you know, getting pos open positions filled. Um, the grant was just announced in September, you know, 
we could start, uh, you know, in October of last year. But even now, you know, today, as you know, projects are ramping up, you know, we still have open positions that that we're trying to fill. Um, I would say, uh, you know, another challenge that that we've encountered in in our particular pillar is just navigating all of these individual initiatives that exist uh, related to mobility and, in our case, uh, you know, talent. Um, we were part of a an alignment meeting at the uh, Detroit Regional Chamber in April that brought together eight separate um, talent-related mobility initiatives. And, you know, there's an impact, you know, potentially to how that affects employers if we're all reaching out to them for um, information in terms of what their needs are or for their participation in panels. And, you know, trying to be very deliberate and, uh, you know, with our app, with our request to them uh, to uh, to not over fatigue them with with requests to let them do their business, but also still get the information and provide the services that we all need. And I, I think, uh, you know, trying to coordinate amongst all of those different initiatives is is and will probably will continue to be a challenge uh, throughout this grant. Sure, and that makes absolute sense, given the complexity of the operation, um, you know, but we've got we've got four years to get it all smoothed yes. out. Uh, uh, Ashley, can you talk a little bit about what kinds of projects um, you're able to fund and whether there are any examples that you can provide of work that you've already done? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I usually say in terms of thinking about projects, we can fund just about anything to support that business with the exception of capital expenditures and uh, software licensing. And so if you think about everything from, you know, uh, potentially engineering services to operations improvement to marketing and sales support, uh, whatever we can tie back to supporting that business in, in thinking about the, their future and helping them to remain or be more resilient in the future, um, we can just about, we can justify it and figure out how to fund it. Um, in terms of recent activity, you know, we're seeing a lot of needs, particularly around um, particularly marketing and sales challenges. You know, a, a lot of these small to medium sized manufacturers, their sales team is the owner um, who has been there for years and years and has a tremendous amount of knowledge, but might be retiring in the next five to 10 years or looking to transition that company. And so that brings two challenges with it. One, how do we prepare that company for the future in terms of sales and marketing? Uh, so, so it's not all just in one person's head as to how uh, how they could potentially move forward with uh, you know the diversification of their product line or services, but also the succession plan for that company, which the 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 project and projects can also fund is succession planning around. At the end of the day, if we don't have succession plans in place for these businesses, uh, that's a critical foundation to their future resiliency and supporting the mobility supply chain. So we're seeing a lot around, around sales and marketing and a lot around succession planning in many of these businesses. OK, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Um, all right, Jacqueline, can you talk a little bit about how will you be guiding employers through the process to get their employees uh, upskilled or reskilled, uh, and I'm curious if you could maybe add a little bit of thought about um, what what does that process look like uh, in terms of um, how, how does the engagement begin? How, how does a company or individual get involved with you uh, to kick this process off? We've already um, begun outreach, uh, some outreach with employers. Um, we, as JV mentioned, you know, we've been busy ramping up our project and building our teams. Um, but in uh, early May, we kicked off with um, the uh, Michigan Minority Supplier Development Council's trade show, which is the Michigan Minority Procurement Conference, forgive me. 
Um, and so we exhibited there because, of course, as you know, as, as has been mentioned, um, the um, initiative has a strong focus on the historically excluded communities. So that was our first out outreach. We also participated in um, the Michigan Hispanic Chamber of Commerce had a matchmaker um, also in mid-May. And so we will continue to do those kinds of outreaches and working with chambers of commerce and the Michigan Manufacturing Association and various organizations like that throughout our region and, and um, you know, Southeast Michigan and keeping in mind that we, you know, go across the state to the Thumb area and down to Lenawee County. So we will be out there. My team is the employer services team and we will be out there um, sharing the good news. <laughs> and um, so what will happen is we will um, we will inform employers that we have this network with the Michigan Works Associations. Our actual dollars will be um, awarded or and are being awarded and have been awarded um, to the Michigan Works agencies because they already have the relationships set up with the educational institutions connected to EVJA. So we're saying, hey, you know, these dollars are out there. Let's get your um, your teams um, upskilled and reskilled. And then, um, you know, my partner, Dan, like I indicated, who's also on the call, he'll be say he'll be um, chatting with folks and saying, hey, you know, you we need I know you need talent attraction services. I need I know you need talent retention services as well. All of this will transact through the Michigan Works Associations um, that are partnered with us. So the dollars don't actually trade hands with any of the employers or even any of the employees. It's all transacted through uh, Michigan Works with the educational institutions. But it'll be our job to make sure that they know that um, these dollars are out there. And a big piece of this is not only that we have GEM dollars available, um, but we will be braiding funds for employers um, and through and for career seekers, but we will be braiding funds together. There are so many different initiatives that have been funded, you know, through the state. Ours are federal dollars, but, you know, there's um, WIOA dollars, there's Going Pro Talent Fund dollars, there's, um, you know, My Leap, there's all of these other initiatives that will um help to pay for credentials for our career seekers and incumbent workers. So um, our our marching orders are to, you know, share the good news, <laughs> spread no, the word. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jacqueline. And just a quick follow up from me. Um, you know, in my prior work, you know, I found it's the small suppliers who often need help the most, <laughs> uh, but are also the most under resourced and, the, you know, frankly, the least likely to even know that a given uh, that a given that service or product is available to them. And so I'm curious, are you finding that yourself in, in your work as well? Um, so thank you so much <laughs> for, for asking that and for pointing that out. Um, yeah, like, you know, the things that Ashley and, and the U, U of M EGI Institute are doing are, you know, just another phenomenal resource. And And so the answer to your question is yes, you know, we know at 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 the core that that's um, that's always an issue for the small business owner and the um, minority business owner is you know informing them of the resources that are out there. We know the larger tier ones um, have the capacity, um, you know, from a staffing um, perspective, they they have those kinds of resources and, you know, the UHYs of the world and the plant Morans of the world. So, um, you know, the other part besides just our, our talent transformation pillar, the other part of it is this network alignment to let employers know, hey, you know, we have resources with the University of Michigan EGI. We have resources available um, to you through Detroit Regional Partnership, through Tech Town, through um, you know all of the organizations that are aligned in this GEM initiative. So um, our focus uh, will um, will be on those um, those size those you know the smaller size businesses and the medium sized businesses as well. Um, we don't have the um, the size restriction, and, and not that it's a restriction, Ashley, don't wanna, but we don't, our, our language for our um, 
our GEM initiative doesn't say that employer has to be under 500 employees, um, just as an FYI, but um, you know, we will be working across the spectrum, generally speaking. Great. Yeah, no, thank you, Jacqueline. And you, you read my mind because I was going to ping uh, Ashley next, uh, <laughs> you know, in, in terms of their, their efforts and when it comes to small versus large companies. Yeah, um, yes, our strategic focus at EGI throughout our history has been on small to medium sized businesses. Uh, you know, there are other parts of the university, particularly that serve those lo larger businesses. But at the end of the day, uh, the obviously those large businesses heavily rely on their small suppliers uh, to, to get their business done. And so uh, that's where our focus is based on this pillar. We also know, uh, you know, the main reason behind that is, is exactly what you said, Bernard, they have a lot typically historically a lot less access to resources because of their capacity. Um, so that's why our focus is there. Um, but um, with the intention, obviously, of the, the trickle up effect of supporting those large businesses also. Great, thank you, thank you. And JB, um, just wanna give you a chance to weigh in on that subject before I, I ask the next question, which is also for you. And you're still muted. <laughs> Apologies there. Um, actually, I was uh, kind of focused on a on a separate question that was just that had entered the chat uh, recently about um, uh, K twelve support and career exploration. I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But um, you know, Jacqueline uh, re responded to our pillar, you know, very well in terms of uh, how we're letting people access, you know, th these services, uh, and so. Um, I guess uh, I don't really have much to add, uh, other than than what uh, what she had to say on that. Can I can I can I just add one more thing, Bernard? Because I think it's an important thing for and I and it crossed my mind and then left, but I want to make sure people understand. So um, the one of the focuses of the Michigan Works agencies is not just you know people uh, people might have an understanding of it is uh, if i'm unemployed that's where i'm going to go and you know get my resume done and you know register for the michigan pure talent connect the other piece of it is they have um they are staffed with um employer services as well so un under the name of employer services or business service coordinators or business service reps and those um, those folks are on the ground in their communities already across our 11 county region, um, already doing the work and knocking on the doors with the employ um, for the local employers. So, you know, in turn, you, it, this goes back to your question about you know size of employers and making sure that the small businesses are included. Um, so they are working very closely because you know, Gem is adding to their pool. Um, they've already had other resources, you know, afforded through the state. So <clears throat> we are, we are, and will be partnered very closely and aligned with those business service teams across the region. It it it's um it's a demand driven focus is what it is um, for that piece of the Michigan Works business. Great, great. Thank you. Those are those are great comments. Thanks. Um, sorry. <laughs> no, no, not at all. That, that was really good information. Uh, JV, so we also have the involvement in this whole um, sort of paradigm shift that we have of technologies from outside of mobility. So, you know, for example, artificial intelligence or AI. So Han, can you talk a little bit about how mm -hmm. we're incorporating those kinds of externalities in our work? Well, uh, AI itself, I'd say, you know, as a as a technology, has an already has a number of applications, you know, in automobiles today. Whether it's um, like uh, autonomous driving, you know, assisted driving, uh, navigation, um, even things like predictive maintenance of when you know your vehicle would be, you know, ready for, um, uh, you know, for maintenance. So, um, I, I, I each of the the pillars, you know, the separate pillars of of the project, you know, might deal with uh, AI in a in its own different way. Uh, I mentioned that um, Tech Town is very focused on um, on research on on companies providing, you know, new hardware and software, and not and not so much, uh, you know, services. Um, 
if um, uh, like a an NVIDIA, let's say, which um, you know, large, you know, AI, uh, you know, provider, um, they, um, you know, they wanted to relocate to the area to do like smart, uh, smart windshields, you know, you know, AI based windshields that, you know, could, you know, assist with, with driving. I'm sure like VIP, you know, would be, um, you know, very open to, you know, helping them find a location in the region. Um, so, while we're uh, AI is is kind of the hot one of the hot you know buzzwords, and I think it got a lot of buzz at, at Mackinac, um, you know, similar to mobility and and DV. Um, the project itself, you know, wants to, I guess, in a sense, be technology almost technology agnostic. So kind of be demand driven as as opportunities come up. You know, how do we deal with this new these new technologies, and if you know, there's an AI focus, uh, then each of the pillars, you know, has its own manner of, of dealing with it. You know, if if there's a company that, uh, if there are job seekers who want to get into that field, you know, for cybersecurity purposes or other things, you know, there there's training available, you know, to to get into that, um, and so they might go through talent transformation. So. Um, it's AI, but then almost any sort of technology might, you know, go through a similar uh, walkthrough. If um, and at the the base technology level, you know, if you know if there's no obvious mobility application, I think we're probably biased to, I guess, be more open to to that technology, but you know, as you get further down the road, as it gets more developed and there is, it's ob there's obviously no mobility application that it may not, you know, f necessarily fit with, uh, with the GEM initiative. But, you know, some of the early on technologies, you know, definitely. Great, thank you, thank you. Um, actually, the, the next one is for you. Uh, and it's it's both a question and also a clarification, but um, can you clarify when a company becomes engaged with you, um, it appears that you are not directly involved in helping them with their operations. You're what you are, what you're doing is guiding them through the process of giving them access to these other entities, MMTC and the others that you mentioned, right? And then there's a certain amount of time and funding that's kind of part of that process. Can you? Talk a little bit about, you know, are there time and or funding caps or constraints in that in that operation? Yeah, absolutely. So, yes, you're correct. We are typically not the technical assistance provider. Um, we help them to find the right resources for them in order to, to gain that technical assistance. Um, and in, you know, through a, a pretty detailed vetting process, we go through that process with them. Um, it, the funding is first come, first serve. So, um, you know, while they may be admitted today, um, you know, hopefully they'll have a, a little while yet to spend the full 100,000. Um, you know, we're probably at about, in terms of admitted companies, we're probably close to half of those that we have a budget to serve throughout the, the grant period. Um, but again, the funding is still first come first serve. It's not necessarily that the full hundred thousand dollars is earmarked for that company as admitted. It's as they spend it, um, you know, it, it's the pro, or pro com, excuse me, companies in admitted in the program then can use the pool of funds first come first serve up to a hundred thousand dollars. Got it. Okay, thank you. That's that's mm -hmm. really helpful clarification. Uh, the next question I'd like to throw it at Jacqueline first, but also perhaps JV, if you feel like you'd like to comment, I think it might be right up your alley as well. Um, but is any part of this work focused on K to 12 support and career exploration? Talent pipelines can be both immediate and more future focused. What what an excellent question. <laughs> um, so yes, as I indicated, um, our pillar has, you know, three, it's got business services, it's got talent services, and it's got network alignment. So from the talent services perspective, um, there's definite, there will definitely be interaction and guidance for um, the K through 12. Um, Dan 
um, who I've indicated my my partner in crime on this, um, has already gone out and met with um, the Michigan Works agencies. And um, an example is Oakland County Michigan Works. They're very, very closely aligned with their K through 12 educational system. And um, they have an activity coming up in, um, <laughs> I believe, September, JV. I'm not sure about the date. Um, and they attract 8,000 um, students in their area. And it's an interactive, um, it's it's called My Career Quest. And they have um, four different quadrants and they have a technology quadrant, a healthcare quadrant and two other quadrants. And so um, those are the types of things that we will definitely be involved in. Um, you know, we have connectivity um, in our organization. We have connectivity with um, the K through 12 system in Detroit um, as well, because we want to make sure that we're touching those students. Um, so, yeah, we will definitely, um, through all of our, our outreach, um, informing the uh, K through 12 educational system as well. Thank you, JB. Uh, yes. Um, so one of the sub awardees in the uh, under the talent transformation pillar is Detroit Regional Chamber, and uh, Mish Otto, uh, I believe, has a uh, has a grant to um, uh, to assist um, you know STEM uh, exposed STEM careers to um, uh, to folks in like secondary like high school age uh, students. I know uh, the chamber recently had a an, an automate uh, you know, manufacturing day or a, like a career day where several hundred students uh, last month were brought to a manufacturer uh, to experience, um, uh, you know, what, you know, some of the work it's done at a at a facility. And so there is some uh, early exposure uh, to this. Um, I would also uh, refer to to Dan um, on the talent uh, transformation pillar. Um, they're developing, you know, training materials, you know, for almost like an intro to EV type training, so that um, you know, not just folks on the front lines of working with job seekers, career seekers, incumbent workers, you know, education on like what. EVs are and in sort of what some of these careers are, but you know potentially these are materials that can be shared with students and with parents, you know, to help them educate them on the potential careers within uh, the mobility space. So um, there is some um, some efforts going on, but it's uh, I know a lot of our focus, you know, tends to be on like immediate job seekers, folks who are uh, you know ready to work, but there is some uh, some K through 12 exposure, you know, within the grant itself. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and just a quick answer to Carter's question about whether uh, we have any involvement with the Detroit region Aerotropolis. Um, and so the answer is, so the Aerotropolis is not an official part of the program in terms of receiving funding from the program, but um, you know, their work certainly falls within our definition of mobility. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure that we will be um, somehow interacting with them, somehow working with them, uh, just not as an official grant recipient of, of this work. Um, okay, uh, next question. And I think this could apply to just about any of our pillars. Um, you know, but maybe Ashley, it's been the longest since we've heard from you, so I'll throw it to you first in terms of the expertise that you're providing to some of the companies that you're working with. Um, how about tapping into the talents of retired engineering professors? And I would say not just engineering professors, uh, but also retired executives and, and other staff who are interested in switching out or changing their expertise to an industry as a consultant or a part time employee in the field? Yes, so I will say uh, both many of the staff that EGI employs for this program um, and across EGI programs and also the consultants we use uh, fall into that, that, that category you just described in terms of they're kind of towards the end of their professional career. They're not 
fully ready to go sit by the lake yet and uh, enjoy life. They still want to work and, and often want to give back. You know, they've, they've learned a tremendous amount of information throughout their career. And so, uh, you know, our team, our team across AGI is staffed with many of those individuals, but many of the consultants, um, you know, we work with in, in, as providers of technical assistance to the companies are, are, are also from that perspective. Um, they they've kind of narrowed their focus into something that they really truly enjoy and specialize in, um, and then today are offering it as consulting services uh, to give back to those companies uh, that they that they like likely worked for, uh, you know, uh, back back in their careers. Yep, and I likewise, and in my previous work, I have found uh, retirees to be very, very valuable assets, and you know they also tend to have connections as well as knowledge and information. So that network can also be very valuable. Uh, and, and Jacqueline and JV, just curious about uh, that thread of operations in your in your pillar. So I'll 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 take the first stab at that. So uh, speaking on behalf of the talent transformation pillar, I I know that you know myself uh, being an auto industry veteran, but then also working with startups and with um, you know technology, I I know that I um, you know felt that I had more more to give, and I I was sort of at a loss for kind of what I what my next uh, you know gig should be, and you know I I I view this role is a just a a tremendous opportunity to you know to give back and to leverage the connections the knowledge that i've built up uh, over time uh, also with um with the team uh you know dan Resky is a uh he's a one of my program managers he's uh a ford veteran of 20 plus years and so he had taken an early retirement and now you know he's but he's you know now joined this operation and he you know he told me that if i'm not if i wasn't doing this i'd be a ski instructor up north you know so he was kind of ready to to go up to the lake but you know this <laughs> this sort of initiative was attractive enough to to bring him in and and Jacqueline you know she's a former business owner has worked with a number of mobility clients and you know we're definitely leveraging her network uh, of of context within the region, you know, both with um, uh, with companies, but even you know within the MMSDC, the Michigan Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, you know, she's very well connected, and uh, you know those connections are invaluable in helping us move this uh, project forward. Thank you, Jacqueline. Any any thoughts from you? Your name was dropped just a minute ago. <laughs> um, I I would only add that I see it across all of our um, all of our pillars that everybody has team members who have hopped you know hopped on our gem bandwa bandwagon um, and are just being you know great contributors. So it's it um, yeah I see it across the whole spectrum. Yep, and I've already done it, but I want a second and third that in, in terms of my my work <laughs> as well. Um, and then Colin, I just want to read Colin's uh, note here because it might be of interest to some others as well. Uh, but my career quest SE is November 14th, and he, oh. he says it's a fantastic <laughs> hands-on event for 8,000 high school seniors. Uh, and there's a similar event planned in St. Clair County, uh, and therefore it would make sense to look at these events and, and similar ones as well. So thank you for that note, Colin. Um, thank you for the date correction. <laughs> there you go. Um, OK, so here's one that I think is more JV and Jacqueline, but uh, any thoughts about collaborating with organizations such as Digital Lakes Michigan that are focused on training and retaining youth in Michigan? Jacqueline, do you want to start with that? Sure. Um, yeah. So that's not um, that's not an organization that I'm familiar with, but we, you know, would definitely want to partner with those types of organizations. Um, um, University of Michigan Economic Growth Institute, as an example, um, to something similar to that, um, was part of a webinar um, through MMSDC. Forgive me again, and um, 
just this is just a similar story. There was a um, an individual on that webinar from an organization called Diverse Note, and they are um, woman owned, black owned. She sits on the MMSDC board. And she's um, doing this tech training, and she wanted to get involved specifically with EVJA. Um, and so Michelle's team, I coordinated with Michelle's team and with Lori Huber, and she presented her capabilities to their team and is in the process of, um, we hope, being added as a training institution to the EVJA um, Academy. So those kinds of things are already happening. And, you know, we want to involve as many partners as, you know, make sense for um, the collaboration and that can add value. So absolutely. And, and, right. and they, and I know, you know, and I'm sure you guys, everybody on this call would know that they continue to build and add partners. Great. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, yeah, go ahead, JV. Oh, so, um, I like uh, like Jacqueline. I'm not familiar with Digital Lakes Michigan, but um, one of the things that uh, that our pillar uh, is doing is uh, we just uh, released an RFP for a consultant to build uh, what's called okay. uh, an employer support network, and this consultant is to, is there to help us identify what uh, employer needs are you know, the process for them to engage in any number of uh, service providers that they may, you know, identify like, hey, I need someone to help uh, to help me get, you know, young talent in Michigan, as an example. Um, a Digital Lakes Michigan could potentially be a vendor, you know, in that new uh, employer support ecosystem that we're looking to create as part of the talent transformation pillar. And so uh, it's on our radar, I guess, to sort of help us understand who they are. And, you know, I'm going to, you know, Google them after this call, but uh, it sounds like an interesting uh, and worthwhile organization, you know, with with that uh, particular mission, given, you know, the talent needs that, that we have. Great. Thank you. And uh, Ashley, uh, EGI's name was dropped there uh, a few minutes ago. Just wondering if you'd like to weigh on this uh, as well. Yeah, um, so, you know, it's, um, uh, can you, uh, sorry, I apologize, Bernard, can you just repeat what your original question was? I want to make sure I'm addressing it directly. Yeah, of course. So, you know, we, we're, it, it's been kind of a, a an expanding point, uh, but we're talking about both the training, but also just the retention of people in, in Michigan. Um, you know, and, and uh, as an aside, I will mention this at the Mackinac Policy Conference, um, there was a release of a study by Richard Florida and, and his group that dealt with exactly this uh, this subject. And so uh, I'd encourage you to to look that up if you haven't come across it. I found it Pretty neat stuff, even though I've just gotten uh, the chance to scan it and not read it in depth yet. Um, yeah. But all right, Ashley, take it away. Yeah, I, I encourage everyone to take a look at that. Also, very interesting data. Um, so, you know, in terms of the retention piece, you know, many what we're seeing too as we're out there working with companies, you know, the projects we're doing, while they may be operational or they may be marketing and sales focused, really there's a, a underlying theme behind not only attraction, but also retention of their employees. Um, you know, a lot of the activities that they know that they need to do in their businesses are to make the company interesting and to make the company, the manufacturing uh, sector, uh, an interesting career path for future uh, potential manufacturers and also those currently there. So things like the integration of technology really keep com keep many uh, employees there because they love that interaction um, and the new and the latest and greatest of you know of technology integration. And so the projects that we're seeing companies implement are not only from an efficiency standpoint or you know Im improving sales uh, but also often these employers are looking at it from the perspective of what do we need to do in our business today to attract future manufacturers th those younger generations 
but also how do we retain our current employees by keeping them engaged and making sure that they see that we are a resilient company that's going to be here for the future of their career. Great, thank you. No, um, mm -hmm. great point. Uh, and I see we have uh, quite a few resources that are being dropped into the chat right now. So I just want to thank those of you that are contributing the, that content. Um, and I want to make sure that everyone is aware that there are a few pretty darn cool links uh, in those uh, in in that whole dialogue that we're having. Um, OK, so we have now been in, in this uh, Q&A mode for nearly 50 minutes. Uh, and I, I just want to respect everyone's time here, even though we could definitely keep going. Um, so, Michelle, I definitely want to give you a chance to make some uh, closing uh, remarks if you like. Uh, but uh, from my point of view, I just want to say thank you very much for the chance to be involved with this. Uh, it was a fabulous conversation and uh, Jacqueline, Ashley, JV, just fantastic content, um, you know, really solid information. And frankly, I'm involved with the GEM effort and I myself learned more about the GEM effort just as a result of this conversation. So thank you. And also um, fantastic questions from our participants. Uh, you know, we really appreciate you keeping that going and turned into kind of the lifeblood of the dialogue. So thank you for that. And with that, Michelle, please take it away. Well, thank you, Bernard, JV, Jacqueline, and Ashley. Uh, I echo Bernard's comments that I learned a great deal so <laughs> about this important initiative that's underway. So I, I'm sure that our listeners also gained a lot of good information. It, it really is starting to come together um, in my mind, um, all of the important work that will be done uh, throughout our region over uh, the grant period of performance. So thank you on behalf of MAGMA Governing Board um, for your um, insights uh, today. And thank you to everyone that attended with uh, your good questions for a really good interactive uh, discussion this morning. Have a great weekend all, and we have recorded the session if anybody would like to distribute to uh, individuals that uh, would like to also um, have more information about the GEM project. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard.